All right, in three, two, one. Welcome everybody to an episode of Enlightened Masculinity. This, ep- this podcast is sponsored by Ninth Limb Yoga and my co-host Yogi Chris, PhD, is currently flying right now from Hollywood back to Florida. So you may catch us for the second part of the interview, but nonetheless, my name is Akash Inti. I'm another co-host of this podcast, formerly a biotech research analyst, now avatar designer, masculinity coach, things of this nature. We are joined with a very special guest today, shaman James Hyman. James has, has been one of my personal shamans specifically, and I've done some incredible, incredible work with him, but he's been practiced in the field for over 30 years, also a metaphysician, um, and really has this theory of deep emotional uh, release and quantum theta healing. So we'll be getting into a bit of this later today in the podcast itself. With that, I want to say thank you, James, for doing this interview today. And do you have any opening remarks as to as to what? No, no, I'm glad, glad to be here. It's uh, not only is it a new year, it's a new decade. So I find it kind of auspicious and uh, powerful. So I like it. It's good. Yeah, it's incredible. So James and I just were just came back from the Evolution of Consciousness 2020 convention hosted in Hollywood by, and produced by Vince Kelvin. Absolutely, absolutely incredible time. And one of the really interesting pieces to the convention itself was when we were in sweat theory and, and James, along with Vince, led a, uh, a sweat lodge, uh, hypnosis, trance. Um, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it necessarily, but it was just it was a lot of breath work. It was so much breath work and there was so many breakthroughs, not only for myself, but from some of the other gentlemen in the room. It was absolutely incredible. With this, James, I want to dive into what is shamanism because i'm sure many of our listeners may not be aware what is what does it mean to be a shaman well i'll give you two different explanations well, the simplest one is a shaman i would i would just say is a technician of the sacred so anybody in a sense from uh anywhere in the world any time any culture uh, when they begin to develop a relationship with, instead of necessarily the, the phenomenal, phenomenological world, the world of objects and things, but more of the noumenal world, the world of the unseen, the world of energy, the world of the unseen world. And uh, so when you begin to enter into a relationship with that and you begin to study the nature of energy and how energy moves, uh, again, that, that technology becomes the technology of the sacred, that which uh, brings us into a, a deeper emotional, uh, empathic relationship with life and the world and, uh, and all the beings on it. Hmm. So what, what type of, what types of work do shaman do with people? Or how, how does, how, how do shamans work with people to uncover more? Well, I mean, again, it, 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 you know, you've, you've got a discussion, you have like, you know, indigenous shamans, the shamans that come really from the fourth world, you know, say from the Amazon, from Siberia, uh, anywhere in the world where, you know, people are still connected with nature, connected more with a, a natural world. That level of shamanism is the type of shamanism that's been practiced on the planet for thousands and thousands of years, you know, all over the planet. And in and, and, and that definition of shaman, I would say that shamanism is our natural proclivity towards spirituality, but right? a spirituality that's not necessarily like, not like religion, it's more a spirituality, it's relationship with the earth, with survival, with the unseen forces of nature, uh, with life and death, uh, with male and female. Uh, and, and, you know, really, shamanism is our natural way of relating to our existence here. And it's a, in a way, it's somewhat dependent upon the culture in which you are raised in. But at the same time, it goes beyond the culture. It goes towards our true natural relationship uh, with the earth and the earth energy and life itself. So James, how did, how did you get involved with this then? I mean, it, it seems, I know you've done some, <laughs> some work back in Peru and, and you've studied in the Amazon itself, but what, what got you it's interested in this to begin with? And then how did you follow your path to, to where you are today? Well, I, I guess it was pretty much, I was uh, about 26 years old and uh, I took my first LSD trip. And I was up in the mountains in Colorado, and I actually had been up there for three or four days. I wasn't into meditation at that point, but it had been raining for three days, so I was in a tent for basically three days, which was kind of like a meditation. And uh, after that, I was with my younger brother and my good friend, a good friend of mine at the time, 
And uh, I had never experienced psychedelics, even though, you know, they were around me when I was in college and stuff like that. I was, I felt like I was too emotionally and psychologically fragile. I wasn't time to, to do that work. And in that experience, because I was up in nature, I was way high up in, up in, the, uh, up in Colorado in the summertime. And it was just a beautiful day when we actually did this. I had this experience of having these memories, very direct uh, memories of like when I was a child before I went to school, that I could do things like leave my body, you know, project myself across the front yard into like a bush, of, you know, and, 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 I, and it was like very shocking to have this memory come up because it really had been a, like completely, you know, under buried, repressed memory, probably since I was four or five years old. And one of the things that I noticed was that in assessing what cut me off from that natural energy was, you know, I think for some people, especially at this point, you know, because I've done so much work with people, at some point they would, people would say, well, that what cut them off was the, the, the this disruption in their childhood, their family, uh, there might have been abuse, might have been, you know, tragedy of some kind or alcoholism or different things. Uh, for some people, that's what causes the disrupt. For me, it was school, and I recognized it that day. And it was when uh, I got sent to school that the programming, and I, that day I had a lot of strong memories come up from when I was really young, like, say, six years old, seven years old, and, and I saw all these patterns that had got put in place. And I said, well, if I could do that when I was four, five years old, four or five years old, and I could do this again when I'm 27 in this kind of altered experience, then, you know, somehow I should be able to find my way back to that level of experience in life. And I didn't realize what I was doing at that time, but I was kind of making a dedication for my life's purpose to really be on a spiritual path. It wasn't really a conversation that was really happening at that time, but it was, those were the, the natural seeding that happened. And then it was really, um, Right after that, I went to, to Spain. I lived in Spain for a year. I was living with gypsies, and I was studying guitar. And I started reading these writings by this guy named Carlos Castaneda. And, and uh, at that time, there was the, the word shamanism did not even exist in the vernacular of, of American youth. There was absolutely zero consciousness. There was nobody doing shamanism. Uh, a, a few books existed on shamanism, but they were literally academic, very, very academic uh, anthropological studies, field studies of somebody who would go into, say, a jungle. And, and, but they weren't studying shamanism by taking on the practice or the ritual initiation that goes with it. So I called him power, and that's really what it was. I, uh, in reading these several of these books when I was in Spain, I said this was the science that I, I wanted to study. This was what I wanted to do. And we didn't use the word shamanism, so it still wasn't in consciousness. But what I was very clear about at that moment in time, that my life was going to be really about the study and the pursuit of, of higher consciousness, for better or for worse. Yeah, because you know, it was at a time where, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a time when a lot of my contemporaries were, you know, it was like, you know, they were seeking their fortunes in the big city. <laughs> and I was, you know, looking for my, uh, my spirit guides in the mountains. So, but, you know, it was an amazing journey. It is, it, it literally has been an amazing journey. It's been 45 years. And the, the other interesting thing about it, um, uh, was that when I came back from Spain, you know, I think, um, you know, I did a lot of work with en entheogens, basically substances that allow us to uh, trip, putting it in that vernacular, and worked with very, uh, what I called microlytic or catalytic dosages, very small dosages of psychedelic, and would do a lot of vision work. And at the time, I was doing a lot of, you know, studying. Qigong, Chinese energy work and, and yoga and, you know, studying as much shamanism as I could from uh, what little literature was out there, but from what people's paths, whose paths I crossed. But mostly it was on my own. It was really, you know, it was a radical path of, of self-discovery.
That's incredible. And, and it's it's really incredible, James. Just hearing <laughs> hearing a how you kind of unearthed and brought back a lot of the, the practices itself and brought them back to life. Because one of the things I've been learning is is that the the teachings of anything is only as alive as those who practice it. So to see someone who's mm. been practicing for such a long time and, and really bringing back the, the the traditions, the ancient traditions, and bringing them to the modern era where it seems like it's needed more than ever. Um, is absolutely absolutely. Well, this is incredible. this is definitely true. Yeah, no, no. I've, I've actually, it's more exciting now than ever, and it's really more exciting uh, now because, like, in, in speaking with you and in, and in realizing, uh, <laughs> I wasted a lot of breath on on people my own age throughout the decades. They weren't ready for this. You know, most people, well, I, th- I was actually looking at, like I was looking at some of the news today, you know, and looking where the planet's at and thinking, you know, it was really kind of my generation that let it get to this place. And w- in some ways, you know, this, the younger, it's really the responsibility of the younger generation that's coming up, that's waking up now. It's really their responsibility to wake up and realize, holy shit, man, you know, we, we've got to, we've got to like, it's not about turning anything around. It's about turning the mind on. It's about turning the spirit on. It's about turning the, the will on. So that uh, it's not that we can personally have what we want, because if we don't really, in a way, create world peace and world conscious opening, you know, none of us are going to have our vision. We have to kind of work now. This is like the new, the kind of the new energy is we, we kind of work to have to work for a collective vision as well as for a personal vision. So James, will you talk so this about this? Con- yeah. Will you talk about this concept of vision? What do you mean exactly by personal vision as well as collective vision? We explain, explore into that a bit more. Okay. Well, let me go back. When I was doing the work, what happened was, is when I came back from Spain, I had been reading some books on native American uh, medicine ways, shamanism, you know, and basically I, I, I think I read a book called black elk speaks. And I thought, you know, this was a man who, when he was in his, he was a young warrior and he went out and on a vision quest and he received a powerful vision and it was a vision of his own personal relationship to his life in that lifetime because he was a young man. And, but also he was Lakota, he was a Plains Indian, he was, he was Lakota and he was shown what was coming with the coming of the white man and the destruction of the medicine way. And he, in his lifetime, saw that whole process and witnessed that whole process. And he was actually uh, interviewed like when he was well in his 80s. And it was like 1908, I think, when the book, they interviewed him. And then they wrote the book called Black Elk Speaks. And I said, I want to have a vision. (laughs) Be careful what you ask for. (laughs) Because uh, I can't remember what I did to prepare myself. I probably did some fasting and, you know, what, what... what level I could meditate at that point, you know, I was just a novice. And, uh, but I received a full vision. I received a full download of the world that I live in, how it got to this place and where it was going. And that was literally four and a half decades ago. And I would have to say, when people say, wow, the world's really messed up. I, I usually have to say, no, everything's right on schedule. And the power of vision, I mean, because vision comes, it comes with a heavy responsibility. Because, you know, oftentimes you will have a personal vision, but because a, a vision comes from spirit, it's your personal relationship to the collective, to the whole. Like, what are you here to give? What are you here to do? What are you here to receive? You know? And... Uh, we're living in a time where, you know, I think because I have a 19 year old daughter and, and you know, uh, you know, her generation, young, you know, they're, they're like, oh, my God, you know, what's going to happen? And my message is, is, you know, it's always happening. And the beauty of it is it's always happening. It's always happening in the present moment. This is the most difficult thing for human beings to really get. So in the vision work. You know, I would have all these visions, but I would get to a place when I was doing the vision work where a lot of deep, deep pain would come up, deep emotional, I would call it existential wounding would come up because I would see things like past lives and I would see that in some respect, you know, death doesn't resolve anything and there's no way out of this matrix and this is a matrix. 
this this quantum living pulsating uh, reality that we live in and um, I guess you know all I can say to people is is that we're living in a world where the only way to combat the new world order the only way to combat the onslaught of technology that's coming is to really work at raising your frequency, really getting in touch with, with, with what it means to have a spiritual life in relationship to having a, a very material life. You have to have both to be a whole human being. If you just had a spiritual life, you're just kind of like, you know, I mean, it's fine. Many people have done that, but it's like being cloistered. You know, you're like living in an ashram or a monastery. And, you know, we're talking about because of really this, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, what, what does it mean to be really in the world? and to be male in the world. It's a, it's a powerful question one has to continually ask themselves. And, and you know, I said this like, to the group this weekend, it's like, you have to find the alpha you. Then you can be free, and you can be whole with yourself. You that's have incredible. to find the alpha you. Yeah, that's incredible, James. And, and that was one of the things. So throughout the weekend itself, we did a lot of breath work and. And specifically, I can speak for my experience, and, and it seemed like for some of the other gentlemen was that there, there was in a way, an inexplicable way of describing what had occurred, yet at the same time, every single person in that room was able to say something, something really changed there. And there was a lot of change that happened yeah, to many individuals. That was, that was all vision. I mean, that is the breath work. I mean, this is ultimately, you know, as I let go of the, you know, of plant medicine and let go of, of any psychedelics and all that stuff was way behind me. Letting go of that, I had to still keep going deeper and deeper into the process of vision work. And so the breath work is really the pure form. And then also doing the work like that learning the meditation with your eyes open, because it's the only way you can meditate and be really in reality. All other meditations, they're fine. You close your eyes but you're still going into like an inner dreamscape. And the most difficult thing to do is to wake up right here in this reality because there's only this moment. And not only is it only this moment, I mean, it's like you and I can talk about like the nature of our reality because you're back east, you're on the East Coast right now. I saw you just a few days ago. You were in Hollywood, okay? And I'm in my room right now and yet, this is the same present moment. We're sharing this present moment. There is no other space. There's no other experience. Whatever past you're carrying is in your consciousness, but it's just a, a system of thought forms. My past is just a system of my, my thought forms. They have nothing to do with anybody else's reality. Although, if you think about it, you think your reality is the same reality that, he, that everybody else is experiencing, but nobody else is experiencing that reality. Mm, there's a okay. richness to that. There is such a richness. To that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. And so I guess one of the things I want to say about being 2020, because it really is, it's, it's momentous, that this is the first day of the 20th century, of the 21st century. Now, I remember uh, on New Year's Eve 2000, I said to people, my, I was with my friends, and my daughter was just, she was going to be born in three months. So it was very exciting. And I said, Everybody says, wow, it's the 21st century. I said, it's going to take 20 years to get through the transition zone. And when it's 2020, that's when we actually are ushered into the real energy field of the 21st century. We have to get rid. So when you think of what's been going on in the world for the last 20 years and culturally, and, you know, it's a lot. That's two decades. Like if you were born in 1990, like, you know, that's, that's two-thirds of your life already. Okay. And so it's like, uh, it helps to put it all in a kind of perspective. You have to stretch your imagination a little bit. That's part of the vision work, learning how to understand what vision is, because vision is happening all the time. Like, let's say you're out in a club and you see a, a girl you like, and you start talking to her. If you're really paying attention, your inner mind is creating a whole scenario of what you want to already happen. If you really like her, you're already in a relationship with her. Mm. Mm. Okay? That's vision. That's vision. 
If you act upon that, you may end up with a family. Mm. That's how the world gets built. Vision has to occur before action can happen. That, that's incredible. Otherwise, it's just... James, that's absolutely, absolutely incredible and so, so rich. We're going to end it here. James, if anyone wants to work with you, what would be the best way to get a hold of you? or, or, or... Just to, to give me a call, which would be 805-302-8448. That's 805-302-8448. And really, I mean, I really invite people to call. I do work over the phone. And at this point, what my work is about, because for the first 15 years that I was doing shamanism, it was all what I call warrior shaman. And it was all about power and metaphysics and learning how to feeling like I needed to, wanted to master my world. And then because of, you know, in shamanism, because really shamanism is about healing, healing energy. And it usually somebody, you have to heal something within yourself to kind of at least get your, you know, your, your first level of, of, uh, of wings in a sense. And uh, so after about 15 years of being on the path, uh, I actually had to do some serious healing work on myself. And that's how I started becoming a healer. Wow. And, and that opened up a whole other thing because that brings you now in touch, literally in touch, you know, with other beings. That's incredible. James, thank you so much. We're going to end the first episode here. I highly encourage you guys to tune into the next episode with James where we're going to dive into a couple other topics itself. As you guys know, check out the Enlightened Masculinity Facebook group, putting out an incredible amount of content. Like, comment, subscribe if you guys like this content. So with that, thank you, James. Namaste.